All right, 102, so we'll get this party started. Um, so my name is Christian, I'm the National Medical Training Specialist for ACE. Um, so I've been teaching wellness first aid and wellness first responder courses for a couple years with Desert Mountain Medicine. And before I go any further, is anybody having issues seeing my screen or hearing me? And feel free to unmute yourself and talk to me. This one will be interactive and uh, yeah, don't be, don't be shy. We're all friends on the old Zoom. Looks good here. Sweet, thank you. Cool beans. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been teaching these courses for a couple of years and I'm really passionate about this. Um, and actually just a couple of days ago, um, one of my students was viciously attacked by a dog out in the backcountry location on a ranch. So, uh, you know, that's just a sign. This is going to be a good topic that a lot of folks are going to use, whether they're in ACE or outside of ACE. So we'll get this party started. Uh, but first of all, where are folks joining us from? So y'all can just unmute yourselves and yell out your name and where you're, where you're at right now. Hi, I'm Suika and I'm in uh, upstate New York. Cool, welcome Suika. Who else is out there? I'm Hi, Matthew, I'm in San Diego. Diego. Sweet, we got San Diego, San Francisco. Uh, I'm Maggie from Connecticut. Cool. Nice, we got folks from all over the place. Awesome, yeah, we're gonna be ramping back up in June. So if you're coming to the Southwest Branch in Flagstaff, hopefully we can hang out in person and not just on Zoom soon. <laughs> but yeah, thanks so much for, thanks so much for showing up. Um, so just some housekeeping, like I was saying, this is a Zoom call, so you'll see your little microphone. So if you just wanna keep yourself muted during the presentation, but if you have uh, any comments, questions, or concerns, feel free to unmute yourself and holler out. This is uh, relatively informal. Um, and yeah, today we're gonna talk about wound management and shock. So the importance of this uh, definitely applies to everyone, whether you're working for ACE or you're in the outdoor rec field, or you're outside having fun in the wilderness environment or urban environment, uh, you'll always be able to identify wounds, you'll be able to stop bleeding, and you'll be able to treat and manage these wounds accordingly. Uh, you don't need a specific certification to do these. Anybody can stop the bleed and treat the wounds. Um, and if you're in a leadership role, whether you're leading crews for ACE or you're guiding folks in the backcountry, you got a huge responsibility on your hands. So uh, this is very pertinent information and everyone can do this. So a little outline for today, we're gonna to talk about wound management. We'll go over the different types of wounds. We'll go over how to clean and dress wounds, and then we'll move into shock, uh, specifically what is shock, and then we'll go over different causes of shock and the signs and symptoms and treatment. Uh, the SS there is just shorthand for signs and symptoms, and then the TX just stands for treatment. And like I said, holler out anytime if you have questions or comments. So some different types of wounds here. So we have abrasions, and that's where the top layer of skin has been removed. If you play soccer on AstroTurf and you're wearing sharp shorts and you do a slide tackle, you're probably very familiar with this sort of wound. Then we have blisters. Blisters occur due to heat or friction. Uh, so whether it's the rubbing of your heels or some hot water that has been spilled on your hand, uh, blister is basically an accumulation of fluid within your skin layers. And then we have incisions and lacerations. So this is a laceration down here. I like to think of incision as a surgical incision, such as with a scalpel. And then a laceration is what we come across in the backcountry. That's more of a jagged cut. And then we have impalements. So I have a nice, nice little euphemistic picture up here. Uh, this is, these are some kebabs, so they've been skewered or impaled. Uh, so that would be an impalement. And then if that skewer is removed, it would be a puncture wound. A puncture wound is an impalement where the impaled object has been removed. And then we have an avulsions. So these are also known as flappers or deglovings. Uh, so if there are any rock climbers out there, these are very common. Uh, you have a lot of heat and friction buildup, and a lot of tissue tends to just kind of flap off, but it's still connected. So those are the avulsions. Then we have 
amputations. So a part of your body has been removed from the rest of it. Uh, pretty, pretty bad news. So we're going to talk about these different sorts of wounds and how to treat them and general wound care before we move into shock. So those are the different types of wounds. We'll move into the wound treatment. So wound treatment, this is huge, especially in the back country, if folks are gonna be away from definitive medical care and they're not gonna have access to broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, what does that mean? Broad spectrum antibiotics are basically when you take a pill, whether it's penicillin, Zithromax, or any of those other pills that are antibiotics. A broad spectrum just means that any sort of bacteria in your body is getting blasted and killed. Um, and usually if you're in the back country having fun, you don't carry these broad spectrum unless you have uh, more medical training. So the treatment is first to stop the bleed of the wound. So if that wound's bleeding a lot, you gotta stop that bleed. And then after the bleeding is stopped, you're gonna prevent infection. So we'll talk about irrigating the wound and cleaning it really well. And then finally, we'll move on to promote healing, which is where you're uh, cleaning the wound, but then also dressing that wound and then changing the dressings as you go on with your trip or your evacuation. So a quick little story, I was out mountain biking with a friend and my friend Travis hit this jump on his mountain bike and then he landed on a really sharp rock right on his knee. So I looked at his knee and there was his kneecap uh, basically poking out at us. So uh, first thing we did was we stopped the bleed and then we irrigated the wound really well. We used some tweezers or forceps to remove larger debris. And then we cleaned up that wound, wrapped it up, and then drove him to the emergency department where they actually used their fingers to dig around underneath his skin to pull out rocks and other stuff we had missed. So uh, that's just a little demo here. So let's break that down. So we'll move to stop the bleed first. So you have to stop blood loss immediately. That makes sense. Blood is somebody's life force. It's essential. If you lose too much of it, uh, bad things happen. So we have different ways to stop the bleed. We have direct pressure. So in this top photo, we see somebody applying direct pressure with their hand to the wound and they have their PPE on. If we're ever touching somebody else's blood or putting our fingers inside of someone, we definitely wanna make sure we have all of our personal protective equipment on specifically gloves, and then eye protection, and a face mask in this day and age with coronavirus. Um, so direct pressure, that will usually stop any minor bleeding within 10 to 12 minutes. And then we have this hemostatic agent, so our Sawyers and cross cutters, I'd say cross cutters, uh, they carry the hemostatic agent. So this is basically a accordion Z-fold gauze that's been saturated with a clotting agent, an artificial clotting agent. So as you can see on the directions here, uh, basically if somebody has a lot of bleeding that you can't stop with direct pressure, you're gonna use this more advanced bleed stopper, the hemostatic agent, specifically Celox Rapid. So if somebody's got a big gash in their leg, say they weren't wearing chaps and they cut a big part, chunk of their leg out and they're bleeding a lot, you would use this hemostatic agent to shove it into the wound and then apply direct pressure. Uh, so you can learn more about those on your own time. We're not gonna get too deep into this today since we're focusing more on the wound management side of things versus stopping bleeding. And then the tourniquet, this is only for you folks that have been trained in how to use a tourniquet. Uh, this is definitely not a toy, not something you apply on every bleed. So not gonna get into it, but this will basically stop any major bleed or amputation on a limb, no one should ever bleed out from a limb injury because tourniquets will clamp on and totally stop that flow of blood. So no one should ever bleed out from a limb hemorrhage. Hemorrhage just means bleed. So we are cruising. Are there any questions on stopping the bleed before we get into preventing infection? Sweet, so preventing infection. So we're gonna irrigate the wound with sterile water. And here we're gonna use more than one half liter of water. I always like to say just use a liter or more. Uh, easy to remember, one liter is just one Nalgene 
and you're going to use an irrigation irrigation syringe. That's a hard one to say. So here in this top left corner, we see this irrigation syringe. You would fill it with water, and then you're going to be sterilizing the wound. And make sure you're not spraying this onto your friends. Make sure you're directing this away from you, and you have all your PPE on. And I demonstrate in class, if I have this irrigation syringe and I push it really hard, there's a big spray that goes out about 10 feet. So make sure you don't have your friends or coworkers standing within that spray zone. And you can use your hand to cup around the syringe or you can use an anti-splash guard. Uh, but when I go backpacking, this is essential because it's really hard to improvise this. If you had to improvise an irrigation, irrigation syringe, uh, the way I've seen it done is you have a Ziploc bag, which you fill with water, and then you poke holes in it with a needle, and then you can spray out the Ziploc bag to help clean the wound. Uh, but if you don't have anything to use high pressure, totally fine to have that sterile water in the Nalgene or the sink and to just use copious amounts of water on the wound. And if there's any sort of larger debris, you can remove that debris with forceps or gauze. Uh, be gentle with your patient. It's going to be painful to be removing that larger material from that wound. So uh, be gentle. And down here in the bottom left, we have that sterile gauze or these forceps or Q-tips that you can use to clear away that larger debris that your irrigation hasn't taken care of. And then when it comes to antibiotics, you can use antibiotic ointment around the wound. I usually don't recommend using it in the wound because studies have shown that these irrigation syringes do a great job. If you have sterile water and high pressure, that actually cleans the wound better than triple antibiotic ointment. But you can also use this ointment in addition inside the wound, but I always use this around the wound. So if I have a big open wound here in my arm, I would use it, the antibiotic ointment, just around the wound if you think about it. Anti-bio means anti-life, and when you're inside of your skin, that can actually damage your own cells if you use too much antibiotic ointment regularly. Um, and then we avoid hydrogen peroxide. So this might be news to some folks, but it turns out this hydrogen peroxide, or H2O2, it hyperoxygenates the wound, and that's great because it kills the pathogens such as bacteria and virus, but it also hyperoxygenates your own bodily cells. So we actually do not use hydrogen peroxide in an open wound. Uh, cauterization, we definitely don't do that uh, way outside of your scope of practice. Uh, in other words, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to use a source of heat to flash cauterize a wound to clot a bleed. Uh, definitely not, probably gonna do more harm than good. And then alcohol, we've all watched the old Westerns where folks, pour alcohol into their wound to clean it. Definitely don't do that. Alcohol destroys your cells. Uh, we don't use rubbing alcohol. We don't use hand sanitizer. We don't use alcohol swabs in an open wound. Ouch, painful. So long story short, we're irrigating that wound and removing larger debris with forceps or gauze, and then we're putting antibiotics around the wound, and we're not using all that stuff. So be like Mr. Clean down here. Keep that wound nice and clean because folks can actually die from septic shock, which we'll talk about earlier, which is where uh, a bacteria or pathogen has taken up residence in that wound and is now multiplying and it's affecting the entire body and that's fatal if not treated. So really important to prevent infection. Again, holler out if you have any questions. So we've gone over stop the bleed. We've gone over preventing infection. Now we're gonna go on to promoting healing. So we're gonna to wanna to cover that wound after we've cleaned it. And we're gonna to wanna to re-clean and redress as needed. So some specific wound care. So if we have burns, we wanna stop the burning. So we can use sterile water or water gel. If you think about a burn, specifically a major burn, uh, think about that portobello mushroom you have on the barbecue. So you've got that heat source, it's burning or cooking your portobello mushroom. When you take that portobello mushroom off of the barbecue, it's still really hot, it's still cooking. The same thing happens with 
human flesh and the human body, even if I remove that person from that campfire that they fell into, their skin is still really hot and it's still burning and cooking. So we need to use sterile water that's cool or this water gel to stop the burn. So when I say, when I, when I say sterile water for cleaning wounds or stopping burning, um, it just means drinkable. So if you're in the back country, maybe you've boiled it and have let it cool, or you have used iodine tablets or UV radiation or just a straight up water filter and you've made that water sterile or drinkable. Um, I love this water gel because it is very cool. It's sterile. It's in its own individual package. It usually comes with some sterile gauze that's non-adherent or wet gauze. Um, so for example, when I was working as a firefighter, uh, we were at the ranger station and this family pulled up and one of their children had fallen to the campfire. Thankfully, they pulled the child out very quickly, but uh, this was my go-to for that child because there were burns all over the arms and I wanted something that was cool, sterile, and actually an analgesic or painkiller. Uh, this has analgesics in it. Um, so this is fantastic. I keep this in the camp kitchen. Uh, highly recommended. Um, and then you are going to remove the jewelry. So why do y'all think we would remove jewelry from somebody that's been burned or that has a fracture? Why are we going to want to remove things like bracelets, watches, and rings? So they don't get stuck in the wound? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. So they don't get stuck on the body because if you've been burned or if you have a fracture or there's any sort of damage to your body, that area of your body is going to swell. So if you think about a metal bracelet or a metal ring, as that body swells, that's basically going to become a tourniquet or it's going to cut off blood flow. So we're going to lose blood flow to the rest of the body and it's going to be really, really hard to remove. How are we going to re remove metal in the backcountry if something is swollen up quite a bit? So nailed it, Suica. Um, and then we have this non-adherent gauze. I use adaptic. Non-adherent just means it's not going to stick to the wound. So if you think about a burn, we want to keep it moist. We don't want to suck water from the body. And then when we remove it, we don't want to rip off a bunch of skin. So that's why we want non-adherent gauze. So if you just have regular dry gauze to make it non-adherent, you just get it wet with some sterile water. And then you can wrap some loose roller gauze. Again, loose because there's swelling. You don't want to cut off blood flow. You can wrap some loose roller gauze around the wound. So that's how to treat burns generally. And then I put graphic here because there's a deep wound. Um, it's not super crazy. The person's actually smiling in the photo, but just beware there's a deep wound to the arm on this next slide. So there's the wound to the arm. So that's deep. And the way I like to define a deep wound is when I look inside of a person and I say, you know, I haven't seen that before, or I don't see that on a daily basis when I look at somebody's arm. So I'm going to consider this a deep wound. And when it comes to deep wounds, you better clean that and you better clean that very well because a lot of stuff, a lot of bacteria, other sorts of pathogens are going to replicate and grow very quickly in a deep wound. And there's a lot of area for them to be introduced into the body. So you got to clean that area very well. And we're going to pack this wet to dry. So wet to dry just means that we're putting in that non-adherent dressing, such as this adaptic, into the wound. And that's wet because we want to keep that inside area wet and moist, helps promote healing. And we want to make sure that's sterile, individually packaged, non-adherent dressing, because we don't want to introduce any pathogens into this area. And then the outside layer is dry. So long story short, I would pack this whole exposed area with wet gauze. And then as soon as I pack that whole area, I can just put a little top dry gauze layer on and then wrap a pressure bandage around. Uh, so that's what we call it, packing it wet to dry. If you think about stuffing a bunch of dry gauze in there, it desiccates or dries out the wound, um, which leads to dehydration. And then when we remove it later on, it's gonna be uh, pulling off the scabs that have been created. So that's why we use non-adherent. 
And then we don't want to close these wounds. We'll talk about closing wounds a little, in a little bit. But if you think about it, where do bacteria and viruses and other pathogens like to grow? They like to grow in wet areas with lots of blood supply and nutrients that have been closed off from the elements, specifically ultraviolet radiation, which is basically sunlight. So that's why we don't close these deep wounds because if you close that wound and there's a bunch of, a bunch of bacteria in there, that's gonna multiply quickly and it's gonna become a really gross infected area. So that's why we pack it wet to dry and we keep it open. We don't close these deep wide wounds. So again, let me know if there are any questions on burns or deeper wounds. So when it comes to infection, this is serious stuff when you see this. You know, if there's a little swelling, maybe a little pus, maybe that's not a huge deal, but if we see these other signs and symptoms, then it's getting to be a serious concern. It's leading to sepsis, which is just a system or body-wide infection, a systemic infection. So signs and symptoms of infection, we have redness, edema, which just means fluid, accumulation, which leads to swelling. So we might see some swelling around the wound. Then we'll see pus, which is by metabolic byproducts from your white blood cells fighting that uh, pathogen that's in your body and pain. I'm sure we're all familiar with that scab that gets a little infected or that wound that gets a little infected and it's kind of itchy and throbbing and just feels weird. Um, red streaks from the wound to the heart. So that's why I put this photo here. Somebody has a wound on their forearm and then we can see their lymphatic vessels, which leads to their lymph nodes. And your lymph system uh, has lots of roles, but one of the major roles is fighting infections. So if we see our lymph vessels becoming inflamed, and then our lymph nodes, which is where a lot of this white blood cell uh, pathogen war goes on, uh, we'll see those lymph nodes getting swollen. And then a really serious condition in addition to those red streaks and swollen lymph nodes is when our patient gets a fever and chills. That means that their body's working really hard to kill this pathogen and it's become a body-wide fight. And that is bad news because that means that bacteria has invaded their whole body and that can lead to uh, permanent disability and death. So monitor for those signs and symptoms. Um, so we talked about stopping the bleeding, preventing infection, and um, promoting healing. So how do we specifically treat for somebody if they're infected? Well, in an urban setting, you take them to the emergency department or urgent care, because if we see these signs and symptoms of severe infection, they're going to need broad spectrum antibiotics or other, other supportive uh, types of supportive care, which uh, a licensed physician or physician's advisor uh, will be certified to recommend uh, at home. I'm not just going to start throwing somebody a bunch of broad spectrum antibiotics because that really affects your body. It really affects your gut flora because you know, really important bacteria that live in our guts. So I don't just go throwing people a bunch of broad spectrum antibiotics. There are a lot of people that are allergic to antibiotics like myself. I'm allergic to Penicillin, Zithromax, C Chlor, Moxicillin, Seftin. So if somebody starts uh, throwing a bunch of antibiotics at me, I'm gonna have an allergic reaction, which is not good. So have the pros do the uh, more serious fighting against that uh, sepsis or infection. So when it comes to cleaning these wounds in the backcountry or in the wilderness setting, not in the urban setting, we're gonna soak that wound and warm, clean water for about 20 minutes, three times a day, and that helps promote drainage. There are gonna be a lot of metal, metabolic byproducts in that infected area, so we're gonna make sure that we're drain, draining and then cleaning that area three times a day. And we're gonna clean and redress the wound. So that just means after we've soaked it and drained it, we're cleaning it back up and we're redressing that wound with new, sterile materials. We're not putting on the old crusty stuff. We're putting on the new sterile fresh out of the med kit material because we want to keep that infected area as clean as possible. And then we're going to talk about this soon. 
uh, septic shock, but if we see signs and symptoms of severe infections, such as that streaking, a huge amount of pus, uh, them having that fever and chills, which is mean it's a body-wide infection, we're going to evacuate that individual, and then we'll talk about septic shock. So a lot of stuff going on here, but when it comes down to it, again, we're stopping the bleed, preventing infection, and promoting healing by- I just have a quick question. Yeah. About infection. Um, so I know that for piercings, um, you can clean piercings with a little, like salty water. Um, yeah. Would that help with other infections as well? Or Definitely, yeah. So um, there's a lot that's going on there, but to, to keep it in a simplistic format, yeah, that salt is basically creating an environment in which that bacteria or other pathogen can't live. Um, the way I like to talk about it is, okay, imagine that I'm a little bacteria and I'm in this wound and I'm having a good time reproducing and having fun with my friends. And then all of a sudden somebody dumps a huge amount of salt on me. You can think about slugs when they get covered in salt uh, that causes them to basically burst. And that's what's going on is you're creating an environment that is not suitable for life. Um, but that also goes for our body's cells. So if you have a big open wound, we're not going to want to use salt because that's creating a bad environment for our own cells. But yeah, for a smaller cut, maybe like a little fish hook cut or a little cut, salt is totally fine. Um, but yeah, that's a lot more specific to piercings. And we would not want to use salt if it's a big open wound because that will negatively affect our own body. So great question. That was uh, quite a wordy answer. Uh, did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, great, great questions. Holler out there anymore. So we'll move on to some special considerations. So when it comes to amputations, so a part of your body has been removed, we're not going to want to freeze that body part, so we would never put, uh, I'll just use a thumb as an example. So say my thumb has been amputated. I don't want to freeze that. I don't want to put it into water. If I freeze it, if we think about water, what happens with water when it freezes, it expands. We don't want our cells to burst inside of that amputated portion. So we're not putting it on ice. We're not going to saturate it in water. If you think about being inside of a swimming pool for a couple hours, uh, you get all pruny and weird, uh, not good for the amputated body part. So what do we do with the amputated body portion? We would place it into a plastic bag, seal it up tightly, and then we would keep it body temperature. So in a freezing environment or in a really hot environment, it'll kind of depend on how to keep it body temperature. But the way I like to explain it is we put it into these two Ziploc bags, and then we put it in our patient's jacket pocket because what you don't want to do is you don't want to transfer your patient to that helicopter or search and rescue team and have their body part with you. They need that at the emergency department. It doesn't do them any good if they try to reattach the body part. And it's like, oh man, it's in my backpack. It's not with Stevie at the emergency department. So I like to keep it wrapped and bagged in the patient's pocket to keep it body temperature and to also keep it with the patient. Don't steal their body part. Uh, when it comes to impalements, we're gonna wanna stabilize those unless they're just a really minor impalement. So minor impalement, a uh, splinter, a little fish hook, things like that you can just remove and clean. But if we're talking a large impalement, like a, uh, a big stick through the arm, we're gonna to wanna to just stabilize those and leave them in place because they're actually helping to staunch the bleeding because they have compressed the blood vessels in that area. And then if we try to remove the object and we don't do a good job removing it, we're actually gonna cause more damage. And there are other things that can happen, but the way I like to say it is if there's an impalement, leave it in and stabilize it by wrapping uh, any sort of bandage or tape around the wound stopping the bleeding and we're going to leave any impalement in that is not just a minor impalement and not compromising 
the airway of the patient. Airway would take priority over bleeding. For example, if somebody has a pencil through their mouth and they're at risk of choking on it or they can't breathe, I'm gonna remove that because that's an airway threat. And then small lacerations, lacerations are also called lacs. Those are just those cuts or incisions. Uh, we can approximate or close the wound with steri strips. So here are steri strips over here. So we have that wound there. It's a minor wound, a minor cut. So we use these steri strips to bring the edges of the cut together after we have cleaned it. So we would not approximate or bring together the edges of a wound if it's a large deep wound, like that more graphic photo we saw earlier. Because like I said, if you close that area and you haven't cleaned it well, that's gonna be a little uh, playground for pathogens. And we don't wanna do that. We also wanna continually clean it every day. And then we're gonna to wanna to take these patients to definitive care. So if anybody's bitten by an animal, animals have lots of bacteria in their mouths. Uh, just a really serious example is rabies. So if somebody is bitten by an animal, we wanna get them evaluated by a medical professional. And this goes for humans as well. Uh, we had a core member, crew member that was bitten by uh, an individual a couple of years back here. And I was like, hey, you gotta go, uh, you gotta get out of the field because humans actually have a lot of bacteria in their mouths and those wounds can become gnarly very quickly. Uh, highly contaminated wounds, that makes sense. If somebody uh, falls on the poop shovel and gets cut by the poop shovel, that is a highly contaminated wound. They have to get that cleaned by a professional and checked out by a professional. Open fractures, that makes sense. That's just extremely painful and you have bones sticking out of your body. Yes, please take, them to, take me to the hospital. Serious wounds to the hands, feet, or genitalia. Uh, again, if somebody has permanent disability to their hands or their feet, or their genitalia, that's gonna seriously affect their quality of life. So that's why any sort of serious wounds to these areas which are high use areas we want to get evaluated by a medical professional. And then if you use a tourniquet or a hemostatic agent, you're gonna to wanna to get those individuals evacuated as well because that's a serious bleed. You don't just slap a tourniquet or a hemostatic agent on somebody and be like, oh, now we're good, we stopped the bleed. No, that means it was serious, they need professional help. So a lot going on here, any questions? Sweet. Cool. So we've gone over that stuff. So wound management, do it, plan ahead and prepare. Uh, I'll be going backpacking uh, within the next couple months and I always bring an irrigation syringe because that's hard to replicate. I bring that antibiotic ointment because that's hard to replicate or improvise in the backcountry. And then I have stuff to deal with serious bleeds because if I'm 10 to 24 or or 24 is a random number. If I'm greater than five miles from a trailhead, uh, it's probably gonna be a long evacuation. So that's why I make sure that I have all these really important life-saving materials with me. It's huge that you plan ahead. Nobody plans for accidents, uh, but they happen. So good thing you were prepared. So any questions on wound management? We covered a ton there. And we're gonna move on to shock. And shock, this gets, this gets pretty anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology intensive. So anatomy is the form of the body. Physiology is the function of the body or how it works. And then pathophysiology is the study of basically a disease process or an abnormally functioning body. Um, so we're gonna, gonna get into that and this gets a little more complicated. So definitely shout out if there are questions. So we've all heard people talking about shock. They're like, oh, my friend, yeah, he got hurt and then he went into shock. And um, a lot of folks are like, okay, what does shock actually mean? And a lot of folks use this term incorrectly. So the medical definition of shock is hypoperfusion. And that in human terms is inadequate blood pressure leading to a lack of perfusion. And perfusion is just the supply of oxygenated blood. So right now, my body, there's perfusion in my arm because I've got oxygenated blood flowing to the arm. That blood provides necessary nutrients to my cells so they can continue living and functioning. If I were to slap a tourniquet on my arm, 
and tighten that sucker. I don't have any blood flowing to my arm anymore. So I'm in a state of hypoperfusion or lowered blood flow or non-existent blood flow. So uh, in other words, your cells aren't getting what getting the blood or the nutrients that they need. So that's just what shock is. Shock is an inadequate blood pressure. So we talked about perfusion. It's a really important concept. So again, perfusion is the supply of oxygenated blood to cells. And why do cells need oxygenated blood? It's because cells need food, such as glucose, water, and oxygen. And where do they get that stuff? They get it from blood. And I like to say, what is Big Christian like? What is my body like as an organism? I like food, water, oxygen, and I like to excrete waste. Pretty simple life over here. Our cells want the same thing. Our cells want that food, water, oxygen, and to remove waste. And how they do that? They do that via the blood or the circulatory system. So a visual of this is we have our arteries, which are supplying blood to our body. So there's the postal worker showing up at the uh, eukaryotic human cell and he brought pizza. <laughs> Should have thought this example through a little more, but long story short, we have the postal service working in our body via the bloodstream and delivering required nutrients to our cells. So any questions on perfusion there? Cool, so a lack of perfusion is just shock. An inadequate blood pressure is shock. So what are different types of shock? So I, I like to talk about our circulatory systems. We have our heart, which is the pump. So we've got that heart, which pumps within these containers, there's fluid. So we have the pump, which pumps the fluid, which is inside the containers, which is the blood vessels. So if anything goes wrong with the pump, the blood, or the containers, we're gonna enter shock because there will be a decrease decrease in our blood pressure. So there are some fancy names. So if we have a pump problem with the heart, that's cardiogenic shock. Cardio means heart. Genic just refers to origin or rising from, uh, such as genesis. Uh, and then we have the blood vessels. So if there's a container problem, that's vasogenic shock. Vaso refers to your blood vessels and then genic rising from. And then if there's a blood or fluid problem in our body, say somebody's losing a bunch of blood, they're gonna have hypovolemic shock. So hypo just refers to low or decreased. Vol refers to volume, such as the amount of blood or fluid in your body. And then emic refers to blood. So there's a low volume of blood or fluid. So let's break these down. So cardiogenic, what can cause cardiogenic shock? What can cause problems with our heart? Heart attack, trauma to the heart, or congestive heart failure. All of these cause a reduction in the capability of the heart to do work. And that will lead to a decrease in blood pressure, which is the medical definition of shock. Then we have vasogenic shock. So I put in pink up here vasogenic shocks because we have different types of vasogenic shock. And this is getting a little more in depth, but the way I like to explain this is, okay, vasogenic is referring to my blood vessels or my containers which hold blood. If my body is unable to control the blood vessel diameter, that's gonna affect the blood pressure of my body because if I have a lot of really constricted, really tight blood vessels in my body, I'm gonna have an increase in pressure. And then if I have really loose, really relaxed, really wide open, dilated blood vessels, that's gonna drop or tank my blood pressure. So all of these here, are problems in the body that lead the blood vessels to become extremely dilated or wide open. And again, if you have dilated blood vessels, that's gonna drop your blood pressure and cause shock. So we have neurogenic shock, neuroferrin to the nervous system. That's damage to your central nervous system. So your central nervous system, that's just a fancy way of saying your brain and spinal cord, which are the electrical signal carriers and producers in the body 
So for example, if somebody's in a really traumatic accident, like they have a big crash when they're out skiing or snowboarding or mountain biking, and they actually sever their spinal cord, not just their vertebral column, but also the spinal cord, um, that's gonna cause the messages to your blood vessels to become mixed, and it's gonna cause them to just relax and drop the blood pressure. So if somebody has a lower spinal cord injury down here, we can see all these blood vessels. If they have a low, lower spinal cord injury down here, all the blood vessels below that spinal cord injury are gonna become dilated, and that's gonna drop the blood pressure. And then we have septic shock. So sepsis is severe infection, so septic shock. I put this little picture of this person over here. So if you have an infection in your body that goes body-wide, that's bad news, and your body, uh, its natural response is to increase blood vessel permeability to allow for white blood cells to attack the uh, pathogens that are reproducing in your body, and that body-wide leaky blood vessel occurrence as well as dilation of the blood vessels, again, is dropping your blood pressure. And then finally, an anaphylactic shock, the last of our vasogenic shock types. Uh, somebody has a severe allergic response. So I put a bee here. I have a friend who's super allergic to bees. Uh, they get stung by a bee. Uh, because they're so allergic to bees, they have this anaphylactic reaction to bees. Their body actually dilates its blood vessels. And aside from a lot of other things going on, Again, those dilated blood vessels in the body are going to decrease the blood pressure. So as you see, the common theme here is relaxation or dilation of people's blood vessels body-wide, which causes a major drop in their blood pressure. If there's a major drop in their blood pressure, their cells aren't being perfused. In other words, their cells aren't receiving the oxygenated nutrient-rich blood that they need to survive. So bad news bears. Super complicated stuff here. Hopefully I broke that down. Any questions on the vasogenic shocks? Sweet, so the last one we'll go into, we talked about cardiogenic pump problems. We talked about vasogenic blood vessel slash container problems. Last one we'll talk about is hypovolemic. So what causes hypovolemic shock? We can have blood loss, whether that's internal or external. If blood's leaving the arteries and veins in which it's supposed to be uh, housing, there's gonna be a drop in blood pressure. So blood loss, whether it's internal or external, can cause a drop in blood pressure. Severe dehydration can cause a drop in blood pressure. A lot of our blood is comprised of plasma, which is mostly water. And what can cause uh, a drop in plasma or a drop in uh, water levels in our body? We can have burns. You've seen those photos of really bad burns. There's a bunch of fluid filled blisters. Yep, that'll drop your blood pressure. Illness, exposure. Yeah, if somebody's just exposed to the environment uh, and they're not drinking water, they're, they're going to become dehydrated. And then illness is referring to dysentery. Um, there are a lot of malnourished people in this world, unfortunately, and a lot of them get dysentery uh, due to eating or drinking um, unsanitary water or food. And it's not the actual infection that kills these people with dysentery. It's the subsequent uh, loss of bodily fluids via vomiting and diarrhea that causes their body to drop in blood pressure and that causes that hypovolemic shock. Um, so the way I like to explain this is if I have a hose and I'm watering my garden, that's fantastic. But if I have a leak in the hose, like I'm showing down here in this bottom left, if I have a bunch of leaks in my hose, am I gonna be able to water my garden or water my cells, perfuse my cells? No way, because I've lost all the water. I don't have any water pressure to water my body's garden. So this is the most common one we'll come across in ACE and in the outdoor industry, uh, somebody who has lost a lot of blood or is severely dehydrated. So as you can see, I haven't really put in the treatment 
of these. You can't just say, okay, treat for shock. There's some uh, general ways to support a patient, such as keeping them warm, putting them on oxygen, and keeping them hydrated. Um, that's just general support for shock. But when it comes to treating shock, you have to treat the underlying cause. So if somebody's having a heart attack, they're going to the hospital, they're getting uh, aspirin and nitroglycerin. If somebody has neurogenic shock, we're gonna try to hopefully repair their central nervous system. If somebody's going to anaphylactic shock, we're gonna give them epinephrine uh, to counteract their uh, anaphylaxis. If somebody has hypovolemic shock because they're losing a lot of blood, we gotta stop the loss of blood. If they're losing a lot of water, uh, we gotta replace that water and electrolytes. So uh, where I'm going with that is basically we have to treat the specific causes of the specific shock that they have. But in general, the signs and symptoms of shock are gonna be a decreasing level of responsiveness so LOR stands for level of responsiveness. So the way I like to teach this is somebody should know the, four, the big four. They should know their person or who they are. They should know their place or where they are. They should know what time it is. For example, is it afternoon? Is it 2020? And they should know what happened. So for example, right now, okay, my person, I'm Christian. My place, I'm at my house. Uh, the time, it's about 1.40 and what's going on. I'm having a good old time interacting with friends, uh, doing some wound management talk. So I'm ANO times four, I have a great level of responsiveness. If their level of responsiveness is decreasing and they can't answer those four questions, that's really bad news. That's because their brain's not getting the nutrients that it needs. Uh, there's gonna be an increase of, in heart rate and respiratory rate. So as our blood pressure drops, our body says, oh snap, we gotta keep our blood pressure up, so let's beat that heart faster, and let's breathe faster because we need more oxygen because we're trying to circulate more blood more quickly via that increased heart rate. So we have a decreasing level of responsiveness. We have an increase in heart rate and respiratory rate because we're trying to compensate uh, for our dropping blood pressure. And then if somebody's going to hypovolemic shock because they've lost blood, or a lot of water, they're gonna be pale, cool, and clammy. PCC means pale, cool, and clammy because their blood's going from the periphery, it's being shunted into their vital organs. Body says, I don't care about your fingers, we're losing a lot of blood here, let's constrict all the blood vessels in the periphery and we're gonna shunt that all to the core. So that's why they end up pale, cool, and clammy with hypovolemic shock or red and hot. So red and hot usually deals with the vasogenic shock. So again, vasogenic shock is when your blood vessels dilate a lot, and that means there's an increased blood flow near the skin, and that uh, blood is red, it's warm, so that's why folks will be red and hot if they're in vasogenic shock. And again, this, the medical definition of shock is an inadequate blood pressure, so yes, we will see their blood pressure decreasing. So these are general signs and symptoms of shock, and there are different stages of shock. There's compensatory, decompensatory, and then irreversible. And if we haven't been able to support that patient, they'll expire. Um, so there are different stages, but in general, this is how shock works across the board. So treatment, like I said, you have to treat the underlying cause of shock, but general supportive care, you keep that patient warm, you keep them hydrated. If you have more advanced medical training and oxygen available, you would put them on a nasal cannula or non-rebreather mask and pump them with oxygen. And overall, keep them calm. Just good patient support is interacting with them, keeping them calm. Use the rescuer. Do not want to exacerbate the situation by freaking out. So again, treat the cause of shock. Use these supportive measures. And if somebody's going into shock, that is a medical emergency, and you're going to need to evacuate that patient. There's a big difference between somebody being freaking out and showing signs and symptoms of shock. So, for example, if I was just in a big bike crash, I'd probably be pretty psyched uh, and have a lot of adrenaline pumping through my body. So I'd have this increased heart rate and respiratory rate, and I'd probably be red and flushed. But that should go away within a couple minutes me being calm and sitting on the ground. Uh, 
uh, shock will persist even after that traumatic injury. So we went over the signs and symptoms and the treatment. Pretty broad uh, categories here, shock. Uh, but any questions so far? Awesome sauce. Big takeaway there is shock is very serious. You need to evacuate any patients that are showing signs and symptoms of shock. And shock can come in many shapes and forms. Uh, but just remember, shock is a decrease in blood pressure, and that's bad news because the person's not being perfused. They're not getting oxygenated blood to their cells, which means that their cells are dying, which means that their tissues and organs are dying. So that's bad news, bears. So we covered wound management and shock. Are there any questions at all on this stuff? We're wrapping things up here. So any questions on? how to correctly treat wounds, how to identify shock, how to treat shock, anything in general. Cool, hopefully that means that I did a good job presenting it and teaching it. <laughs> um, so just some, just some other notes. So if you haven't heard, we're ramping back up, which is fantastic. Uh, I know specifically June is our ramp up date. So I really hope to get to see you all and do some trainings with you all, uh, depending on which branch you're going to. Um, when it comes to wilderness medicine, so if you all enjoy this stuff and you enjoy helping others, there's something called the Wilderness Medicine Education Collaborative or WMEC. And those are the big wilderness medicine providers like Desert Mountain Medicine, National Outdoor Leaderships, uh, Airy, Solo, uh, WMA, all these folks, they get together and they come up with the scope of practice. And if you are interested in wilderness medicine, there are a lot of great trainings out there. The Wilderness First Aid course is two days. The Woofer or Wilderness First Responder course is eight days. And the Woofer is really the outdoor leader standard. When I teach Woofers, the folks in the courses are usually uh, outdoor guides. Uh, Conservation Corps leaders or um, folks from the military or who work as professionals in the healthcare setting and they want to apply their healthcare skills to the outdoors because they're going to go have some fun outdoors with friends. So the woofer is the real gold standard, um, but the one is first aid. You learn a ton and that's really should be the standard for uh, crew members or anybody that's working outdoors. And again, I teach for Desert Mountain Medicine or DMM. I highly recommend them. You can check them out at desertmountainmedicine.com. And there's a cute puppy. So are there any questions, any thoughts, uh, whether related to this training or not, anything specific? Sweet. Well, thanks so much for showing up, y'all. It's always great to um, interact with you all, and hopefully I'll get to see y'all soon. And yeah, if there's nothing else, we can call this quits. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Adios.